Good afternoon. We're back. And before introducing Dr. Mark Velland, I would like to uh, read a message for you all, okay? Uh, at 4 p.m., we will have about one hour and a half to discuss ideas and contributions to advance our knowledge in community ecology. We selected some people to participate actively with the cameras and sound on. And these people will have around four minutes to speak, but with no slides, no presentation is necessary, okay? And all the selected participants received an email. Uh, we ask you to confirm your participation as soon as possible, please. Um, and all the other people can participate too on Zoom or YouTube, but without the interaction. So please don't miss it, stay with us. And now let's talk about Dr. Mark Valent. Uh, Dr. Valent obtained his undergraduate and his master's degree at McGill University in Canada and his PhD at Cornell University in the USA. He was an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia in Canada and now he's a professor at the University of Sherbrooke, also in Canada. Dr. Valent is interested in how plant individuals, populations, and communities respond to environmental changes of various kinds. He's also interested in the theories that concern biodiversity in ecology, in ecology and evolution, and the possibility of synthesizing these two domains. And as many people here may know, he's the author of the book, The Theory of Ecological Communities, which has guided the research of many community ecologists since it, put, it was published in 2016. Dr. Valent, thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure for us. And you may start whenever you feel ready. And if you need me, I am here, okay? Good afternoon, can you see me okay? Hear me okay? Yes, we do. Excellent, thank you very much. Well, I just wanted to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me. It's a real honor to be uh, in this lineup of uh, speakers and to congratulate them on a really, really well done uh, symposium. I haven't tuned into all of it, but uh, I've been uh, in several, listening to several talks. It's extremely well organized, lots of time for uh, interesting uh, back and forth. So I wanted to thank everybody uh, for that. And uh, of several of the talks that you've seen already, there will be some overlap with the talk I'll give you today, but I think I come at things from uh, uh, with a different motivation to some degree and uh, with some different perspectives at the end, uh, I hope. Um, you'll have noticed in almost all of the talks about biodiversity that uh, we very seamlessly shift back and forth between our views and our studies uh, of biodiversity as scientists in which we are trying to be as objective as possible and the implications of all of that for conservation and we very frequently slip in words about what is good and what is bad and what is destructive and we're trashing things and so on. And so in addition to talking about uh, what we often talk about in terms of the trouble with biodiversity, biodiversity declining at the global scale, I also want to talk about some of the trouble that can arise when we attempt as scientists to take an objective approach to a topic about which we have uh, very deep passions. We have very strong values when it comes to biodiversity and that can cause trouble when we try to uh, approach things in a, in a dispassionate objective way as scientists. So I wanted to begin actually by posing a question uh, to you. So here is the island of, uh, or islands of uh, New Zealand, an island nation. And roughly 700 years ago or more, uh, Polynesian peoples, arrived and uh, started using the island for various purposes. 400 years ago, Europeans arrived. So presently it is a uh, isolated oceanic island uh, under relatively heavy uh, human use. And so from an ecological point of view, uh, what do you see? What do you think when you uh, see this image of New Zealand? And I was told that you could send comments to the moderators, uh, basically just your thoughts and they will forward them to me. So I'm just gonna pause for 30 seconds and wait to see if anybody has thoughts to share on what they see, what they think when they see New Zealand ecologically. <laughs> 
And and just a second, uh, if you want to write in Portuguese too, send, you can send the messages. Okay, we are receiving some answers here. If I click Q&A, will I see what people are saying? Yes, I was going to ask you Oh, look this, at that, if, okay. Yes. Okay, sorry, I, th I thought I was waiting for you. Okay, great. So uh, altitudinal gradient, endemism, island heterogeneity, dynamics, greener at the top, uh, speciation, meta community, altitudinal gradient. Ah, oh, very interesting. Okay, so often when we think, thank you very much for, for, those, for those thoughts, that's really interesting. Because often when I uh, uh, present this or when people think about you know, biodiversity on oceanic islands, uh, we typically get answers along you know, the lines of the fact that biodiversity is in trouble. So here are a few facts about New Zealand. So since the arrival of people, uh, you know, roughly three quarters of the forest has been converted to some other type of anthropogenic habitat. Uh, roughly half of the endemic bird species uh, have gone extinct, and there is a huge invasive species uh, problem. Here's an example of a flightless bird no longer present on New Zealand. And so this is, these are the kinds of facts that lead us to say things like biodiversity is in trouble. Uh, but there are also some other facts uh, that uh, tell a slightly different story. So since the arrival of people, uh, the number of plant species on New Zealand is roughly twice what it was before. That's biodiversity. Uh, the number of bird species in total hasn't really changed all that much because there's been roughly as many species introduced as have disappeared. And where there were previously no uh, land mammals at all, now there are dozens of species. And so uh, really th there's no other way to interpret numbers like this uh, than to say that there are factors actually pushing biodiversity up in addition to others uh, that are pushing it down. And another sort of related question we can ask is whether or not uh, these types of changes have made, whoops, sorry. I'm trying to move, there we go. Whether or not these types of changes have made New Zealand more or less able to support human livelihoods. So we, as we'll see in a moment, we often hear the argument that one reason to be very concerned about this business of biodiversity and trouble is because it will, uh, increase the capacity of places like this to support human livelihoods. Uh, and I think if we, if, if we ponder that question, the answer might not be so uh, obvious. And it's these kinds of uh, sort of conflicting facts, if you will, that I'd like to uh, address as we, as we move along. So I'm gonna start by talking about, um, uh, or whether the talk is really gonna be about the various things, activities that I do in research uh, in this field. So uh, what, what takes up most of my time actually is um, field biology. Uh, and uh, with these uh, field studies, uh, often other people are conducting similar types of studies and we can get into uh, syntheses where we put together data from many different sorts. And as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, I also theorized to some degree. I'm not much of a mathematical modeler, but I do very much like to think about uh, the theories that, that unite all of these different um, uh, empirical approaches to research. And what I'm gonna talk about today is the, the sense in which all of these um, uh, activities help us understand how biodiversity is changing during the Anthropocene and some of the troubles uh, that I've mentioned uh, so far. So if we begin with field biology, uh, here is the main field site that I work at. This is a couple, uh, an hour or so east from where I live in Southern Quebec. 
Uh, at low elevation, we have uh, sugar maple dominated deciduous forest. This is in the autumn. It's going to look like this in about one month's time where the leaves turn uh, yellow and orange and red. And then as you go to the top, we have uh, boreal forest, uh, so a, a, a colder climate. And we ask uh, quite a few different questions. Um, and all of it is in the context, or much of it is in the context of environmental change at this site and uh, really everywhere uh, on the globe. So temperature is increasing in Southern Quebec as it is elsewhere, roughly a degree and a half, depending on how you look at it over the last 40 years. So some of the things that we study are, for example, uh, you know, why does the range limit of this dominant low elevation tree, the one making the orange uh, and yellow leaves here, why, why does it stop there? You know, what is preventing it from uh, growing at higher elevations? Is it purely climate or are there non-climatic factors involved? Uh, we'd like to know whether or not warming is going to permit some of these species distributions to move uh, up the slope. And we'll see some data that pertains to that uh, in a minute. We have long-term uh, network of uh, phenological monitoring plots. Uh, and we'd like to know, for example, whether or not the sensitivity of populations at different elevations uh, is uh, variable such that uh, climate warming will influence gene flow. Are those flowering schedules going to overlap uh, more or less? And at present, uh, we, this is also part of a, a larger project, this site called the Canadian Airborne Biodiversity Ob Observatory, where we're using hyperspectral uh, airborne imagery to figure out to what degree we can monitor biodiversity using uh, imagery of that type. I'm really just going to get into one, a couple of results from one particular study uh, from this uh, site, which will lead us into the other sections of the talk. So if we start with the general hypothesis that climate warming has driven uh, temporal changes in this community, uh, one particular prediction, as I said, I'm just going to show you a couple of results, is that species distributions uh, ought to shift up the slope. And in order to uh, answer a question like this or test that prediction, uh, we need temporal data. And so uh, Jose Savage, as part of her master's project, uh, took data in the contemporary time period. And we were lucky, uh, many people have made the point that we really need to recognize uh, the massive contributions of people who have collected data in the past, permitting us to do these historical studies. And so out of Miroslav Grantner's lab, one of his students, Gilles Marcotte, um, did a survey of uh, plots at, at this site and of the vegetation, and they left behind quite detailed maps of the locations of where those plots were, and of course the raw data uh, of which plant species were in those plots and at what abundances, which allow us to look at changes over a roughly 40 year uh, time period. So here's the uh, answer to that question about shifting distributions upslope. So on the x-axis of this graph, each dot is going to be is a species in this graph. Uh, this is the mean elevation of the occurrences of that species across the gradient. Uh, so here's a species whose mean elevation was at 800 some meters, and now it is at seven some hundred meters, and so it is below this dotted line, which is the one-to-one -one line. And what we can see is that you know, the large majority of the species are above this line. The average, which means the, the uh, average elevation of their occurrences has moved up the hill. And the average is uh, 36 meters, uh, which is highly uh, significant. So this is consistent with the prediction based on, on uh, climate warming. But it's important to note that this is uh, far less than the warming itself. So if you convert the uh, warming into a distance that the temperature isotherms would have moved up the hill, those have probably moved up the hill roughly 150 meters or so. Uh, and so 36 meters is really a small fraction of where uh, temperatures have moved along this mountain, although it is going in the direction that we would predict by warming. Another result, which is really in some sense is a byproduct of, of doing a study for other reasons, concerns uh, diversity. So here we've seen many studies of species richness. Here's one particular empirical example where we can see that the number of species per uh, 20 by 20 meter plot uh, declines as we go to the top of the mountain, which is as expected. In the uh, modern data taken in 2012, there are more species per plot than there were in 1970. So on one hand, it's not surprising because if species are moving their distributions up slope and there are more of them that lower than higher elevations, it ought to go up. But on the other hand, one can read many uh, synthesis papers with headlines about how uh, climate change is going to be disastrous for biodiversity. So on the on another hand, maybe it's um, somewhat surprising from that point of view. But I show this one example simply to lead into uh, the second section of the talk, which has to do with synthesis. So with a number of colleagues, we were interested in looking at studies exactly like the one I just described. So here's our, our site at Montmagantic, somewhere in southern Quebec. Uh, and many other studies across the globe have been studied, have been conducted of this exact same nature. 
And so we wanted to look at all of them together. You can see lots of gaps on the map here in various places and place, other places where there are very few points compared to uh, North America and Europe, but there's quite a lot of data to see to what degree what we found is general, is it an exception, uh, and so on. So one question is, why do we care about what happens at the local scale? So um, we're talking about 20 by 20 meter plots. In our case, in another case, there'll be a meter squared. Uh, uh, and often you'll hear the comment that, you know, I don't really care about biodiversity at a very small scale because conservation happens at a large scale. Well, one reason to care is simply out of curiosity, we see very striking patterns and we'd like to understand what underlie those patterns. And another is that it is at that local scale that you expect a causal link, a potential causal link between diversity and the functioning of the whole ecosystem. And that's because that's the scale at which uh, plants interact most strongly. So here's uh, perhaps the most well-known uh, study attempting to experimentally link uh, biodiversity to ecosystem function. So in this uh, sandy grassland in Minnesota, uh, the number of plant species per plot, these are roughly 10 by 10 meter plots, was uh, varied experimentally between 24, which we think of as the, you know, the full complement of uh, prairie species, down to monocultures, a single species. And what we see is you know, a proxy for total productivity increases with the number of species. And uh, with nitrogen being the key limiting resources, resource, the amount of that that leaches uh, below the rooting zone is less the more species there are. So there's more efficient use of the key limiting resource. And so it's results like this uh, that lead to the conclusion that ecosystem function depends on biodiversity. And this is at a local scale. Uh, if I have a plant growing outside my office and one growing three kilometers away, the functioning of my local ecosystem is not dependent on the identity of that plant species that's uh, three kilometers away. This is a local scale phenomenon. And so that has led us uh, to what we might think of as the ecological party line. So the things that link what people are doing uh, to the earth, to biodiversity, ultimately to the services that people get uh, from ecosystems. And so here's uh, a line of logic that one can read in many different uh, NGO government uh, type documents about the importance of biodiversity conservation. So point one is that we're losing biodiversity. Uh, the second key element is that biodiversity is necessary for the provisioning of ecosystem services to people. You take those two points together and you realize that biodiversity loss is bad for people. It's not just something that we like uh, and we're sad to see it go, uh, but in fact, even if you don't you know, have an emotional attachment to panda bears or tigers, you should care because it's bad for you. Uh, and therefore we must work uh, to conserve biodiversity by doing things like saving uh, threatened species. So one of the motivations for wanting to do the synthesis study was that uh, you know, we felt as if there was you know, convincing work uh, linking diversity to function. So if indeed at a small scale, uh, there were 25 plant species in 10 meters squared and over time that got cut in half, uh, that might well have important impacts on ecosystem function. But, but in terms of how biodiversity itself is changing, uh, it's actually not or wasn't as well understood at these uh, relevant scales, at that local scale. So we know diversity is being lost at the global scale, but it wasn't so obvious uh, what was happening at uh, smaller scales. So that was the motivation for wanting to do that. Another uh, reason that the logic of this uh, sort of path diagram might be problematic is that you might get direct influences of some of these changes, uh, like climate and so on, on ecosystem functions. So in a northern climate like the one I live in, if it gets warmer, and there's sufficient rainfall, trees are likely to grow more, for example. And the uh, strength of that effect might be far greater than any indirect effect through uh, biodiversity. So one important thing that I need to establish before moving on is how one goes from experimental data to a prediction or an inference about what is happening in the real world. Because when, when we, when we you know, create experimental communities with different numbers of species or maybe Maybe we're going to change uh, carbon dioxide or temperature here. In this example, I've used uh, temperature. Um, uh, you can't simply look at this curve. This is experimental data or you know, pretend experimental data and say that, you know, let's say we did an experiment where we went, you know, we varied things from zero up to 20 degrees. Well, the, uh, the predicted effect on productivity is not this entire height of the curve because we're not expecting climate warming to increase by 20 degrees. 
in order to make an inference about or a prediction about the real world, first we need whoops, to know what is the current temperature in the real world, uh, where do we expect that to go, and then we can look at that particular portion of this curve to make a prediction about how much change in productivity we expect. And we can do this for any, any variable for which we have experimental data. It could be temperature, it could be biodiversity. And so uh, when I saw the results from this paper, I was quite pleased because uh, this was the approach taken. So instead of just saying, you know, biodiversity has a big effect, the idea was, well, how big is that effect uh, likely to be in the real world compared to uh, the effects of other types of drivers? So to describe what we see in this figure, uh, in order to combine data across studies, instead of looking at the numbers of species, uh, compared to some benchmark, which is 0% species loss, we can express it as a percentage. Uh, so in the, in the example I just gave, 90% loss would be, you know, when there's, you know, one, two or one or two species out of the original uh, 24. And then over at 0% loss, that would be uh, the full complement of species. On the y-axis, we have a ratio of how much productivity was observed in a given plot uh, divided by uh, the amount when species diversity was maximal, we take the log and so a value of zero, um, it, by definition, that's what it's gonna be at 0% species loss. And so this is the uh, curve from the real data on the bottom, you lose species and you lose productivity. And on the top is simply a mirror image of what we have in the bottom, uh, because we're gonna be comparing it to other uh, types of variables, which may have had a positive effect. And it's really the absolute magnitudes uh, that we're gonna be interested in. And so then the question was, well, how far are we going to go down that curve? From the previous slide, we saw that we can't simply, you know, look at the entire range of uh, the y-axis here. We need to look at a particular uh, range of it that corresponds to what's happening in the real world. So here the idea was that, you know, in scenarios, I'll show you where the data come from in a second, you know, an intermediate level of species loss, which we might think of as, you know, expected, let's say, is 20 to 40 percent. Higher levels might go as high as 40 to 60 percent loss. So if we take an example from the uh, upper portion of this range, so in the higher levels, if we go to 50 percent, uh, we go to this curve, we say, okay, there is, let's say there is 50 percent lots of species. Well, then here's the effect we expect on productivity, you know, 0.15 in this, in these log ratio units, units which doesn't tell us anything by itself, but as soon as we look at other factors, we can compare the relative magnitudes. And so now we've added to this graph, here's the expected magnitude of a 50% loss of species, and it is comparable to the magnitude of effects of things like acidification on the positive side, warming, you know, getting close to CO2 and nutrients. And so that's the basis of this conclusion that biodiversity loss is a major driver of ecosystem change. It's a, it's a relative question relative to these other uh, factors. So we've heard a lot about scale from uh, different uh, presenters in the symposium. And one of the problems here is that there's a mismatch. So the experiments are conducted at small scales, not just for logistic reasons, but because in fact, that is the scale at which we expect the link between diversity and function. And yet these extinction estimates where we get these you know, possible uh, amounts of biodiversity change come from very large scales. So here's just a few examples of, of where some of the uh, data come from to, to uh, propose those scenarios. And so we see that, for example, across the entire globe, um, you know, we might expect to lose, you know, 30% of conifers. Uh, I mean, one problem is that these aren't actually species that are gone in most cases, but projected to perhaps go extinct uh, because they're uh, threatened. Uh, but the other is that these are just very, very large scales. Uh, and this, this was recognized. So it, it's recognized that it's the local species losses that are most relevant uh, but the idea here was that they could actually be more severe uh, than these uh, numbers, which in my opinion were uh, quite large. And so the global scale numbers are not the ones to plug in that equation. We need the local scale numbers. Um, and so that really was the motivation for going to get them. One important um, uh, uh, caveat, if you will, is that uh, what is being simulated in these biodiversity experiments uh, you know, when we go from a high diversity to a low diversity plot, all we've done is change the number of species. It's still a grassland, uh, you know, with single species plots, it's the same functional types, it's the same species. There's just a single one of them in the different monocultures compared to uh, the mixture plots. And that is not simulating what happens when we go from a tropical rainforest of long lived uh, perennial plants to a monoculture of a single annual species where we spray and plow 
uh, and which we've done specifically for one single ecosystem service, which is food production. And so uh, in those cases, when we convert a tropical forest to corn, we know there's gonna be very large effects on biodiversity. Uh, there's gonna be a huge effect on the ecosystem. You know, how much it matters that there's one species of corn as opposed to, you know, 100 annual crops mixed together, for example, uh, we, we really don't know. And so when we want to go out and get data that we're gonna plug into this equation, what we want is to focus on temporal changes within ecosystems of a given type, because that's what's being simulated uh, in these experiments. So that is what we did. Uh, the data set has been updated since then. There's now more than 200 studies, many thousands of plots, the typical study or average spans uh, more than 25 years. They come from all kinds of different habitats, not just uh, pristine habitats, and they cover roughly uh, the last hundred years. Uh, we've we've seen this graph in a couple of the talks. Here's just the distribution of those effect sizes. Again, uh, log ratio of the number of species at the end of a study versus the beginning. And it's centered uh, basically perfectly on zero. So across all the studies, we see just as many cases of, uh, of, of local richness going up as uh, we see going down. And when you look a little bit closer uh, at indices of evenness, for example, uh, the sample size goes down, but uh, the deviation from uh, zero is still zero. Uh, you can look a little closer at different habitats. Uh, so there's no particular habitats that uh, show strong deviations uh, from zero, including grasslands where you know, these biggest uh, diversity function studies are conducted. One really has to worry about geographical bias in studies like these. Uh, you, know, you, you can see the sample sizes here in, uh, in South America, Asia, Australia, Africa, we have far fewer data sets that we can uh, draw on. And so if those were systematically negative here, we would have been worried about missing um, uh, you know, major declines there. Uh, we don't see any obvious of uh, geographic bias. It doesn't mean that you know, this, these 30 studies tell us everything there is to know about these places, um, but we don't see obvious signs of uh, geographic bias. And uh, as we've also seen in some of the other talks, uh, you know, our data set wasn't, um, uh, you know, unique either. So if you, if you combine data sets from many different uh, taxa in many different uh, parts of the world, uh, you also end up with distributions that are, uh, with averages that are indistinguishable uh, from zero. I won't go into these details because uh, we'll have seen these before. So I want to step back and, and, and revisit uh, the issue of uh, scale and a couple of newer case studies uh, before returning to this question of, of what numbers we want to plug into this inference about whether or not biodiversity is a major player when it comes to uh, biodiversity change is a major player when it comes to ecosystem function. But the global scale, we all seem to agree that there have been declines. So on this axis of this sort of cartoon graph, we have temporal biodiversity change, you know, let's say during the period that um, people have had a major, major impact, the Anthropocene. Uh, you know, below this line will be decreases. And so we have seen uh, plant extinctions at the global level, uh, far fewer in a proportional sense than we've seen for things like vertebrates, but uh, it is definitely negative. When we get to the local scale, when we do things like convert forest to cropland, which we've done in many places, we know we can see serious uh, major declines in diversity. For other factors, uh, we, can, we can see positive uh, uh, impacts, climate change at Momigan Tick, for example, others will be closer to zero. And then at the regional scale, you know, if we're talking about New Zealand or you know a state uh, level type of study, it's often the case that the number of non-native species that have colonized far exceeds the number of native species that have gone extinct. So we tend to see uh, positive changes there. And if we sort of convert that to a, a, a sort of cartoon, uh, we see this sort of hump-shaped uh, effect of spatial scale uh, on uh, biodiversity change in plants. And one thing that sort of jumps out from this, um, if you know the underlying data, uh, or there, there's a couple of things that jump out. First of all, you know, there, there's, there's pretty good data at the level of, of you know, the islands like New Zealand, which is, which is a very large area, and uh, you know, quite a bit of data in small plots, and less data, you know, what you might consider a landscape, a county, let's say a thousand square kilometers or something. And for these local scale studies, uh, they're almost all based either on uh, relatively short time series or space for time substitutions, where we assume that somewhere that has been disturbed by people used to look like uh, a nearby place that wasn't. Uh, Maria the other day uh, said it perfectly. She said, you know, most of these time series, all of it started after the Anthropocene uh, began already. 
And so uh, those sort of holes in the data, if you will, uh, motivated, motivated us to ask, well, are there some data sets that actually allow you to, to fill some of these gaps? Uh, and for in certain situations, there are. So uh, in North America, uh, prior to the arrival of Europeans, native peoples most definitely had an ecological uh, impact on the land. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, but uh, it's also clear that the uh, intensity uh, and extensiveness of impacts of European people subsequently uh, was, was far higher. So the impacts of people uh, saw a major uptick after the arrival of Europeans uh, in North America. And before settlement or after, you know, discovery, if you will, which is, which is definitely the wrong word, but um, early during the settlement process, uh, surveys were conducted. In this particular region, we have this interesting history uh, in which, you know, an initially almost completely forested landscape was, you know, relatively quickly converted uh, to agriculture. This is for the Eastern US. And then a lot of those farms were abandoned uh, during uh, the industrial revolution as people moved to cities and as richer farmland was found uh, elsewhere. So the forest has recovered to varying degrees uh, in different parts of this landscape. In some places, the amount of forest went down very low uh, and then has come back a lot. Uh, here's the average for the uh, Eastern US. And, uh, Early European um, surveyors uh, recorded aspects, information about the vegetation, which lets us reconstruct the composition of these forest communities. So here's uh, one page from one of the original notebooks. This comes from Vancouver Island, because we happen to have done a study there, but the data I'll show you next comes from Eastern North America. And what we see here, uh, so this stuff here, these, these, that's geographic position. So section 11, and we're on a line between ranges uh, six and seven, and at that particular spot in the landscape, which we can find on a map, there is a, a bearing tree, which is gonna bear witness to this new property boundary, and it was an oak, and it was this distance, links are a uh, unit of distance from that property boundary. And so with many, many uh, notes in many places like this, we can reconstruct the composition of the forest prior to European settlement. And then we have lots of modern data from forest surveys uh, in various places to allow us to uh, look at data in uh, the present time, the same forests. And so we have, uh, you know, with collaborators, there's a, there's a large data set uh, for Quebec and the structure of it is quite different than for the Northeastern US. Um, French surveyors uh, went about their business in a different way than did those of uh, British origin. Um, and the hypothesis, uh, which we could test in the Northeastern uh, US was that, uh, this history of agriculture combined with some logging and then followed by forest succession overall should increase the environmental heterogeneity uh, in this landscape. So the, a lot of the landscapes look like the one we see here, which is from southern Quebec. Um, and, and given this history, this is, this is a more heterogeneous place than, than it likely was uh, prior to European settlement. And so the net effect of that should actually be to increase um, uh, tree diversity. So we have it at the genus level. Uh, rather than uh, the species level. And here's a, a different study, not, not our study. This is from the literature, which, uh, you know, from which we gained some inspiration. And so uh, on the x-axis here, we have the proportion of natural area in a given landscape in uh, Southern Ontario. So, you know, a value of one would be, you know, probably entirely forested, a value of zero would be entirely agricultural. And avian richness, the number of bird species peaks somewhere in the middle. And uh, the inference is that it has something to do with heterogeneity. So there's more land cover variety uh, in a mixed landscape than there is either in one that is entirely natural or entirely uh, under human use. And one of the reasons for the declines at the two ends is because there's some birds uh, that specialize on these two types of open or forested habitats that have very large area requirements. Uh, plants typically can persist in very small areas. And so even when you reduced forest cover down to a relatively small amount in a landscape uh, in, in you know, the North Temperate Zone like this, uh, you don't actually tend to lose uh, species at the, at the scale of the entire landscape. And so our prediction was that the more of a township uh, that was in agriculture at its peak time, actually the more we would see an increase in diversity because these would be more heterogeneous places. At some point, if you go too far in uh, converting a landscape to agriculture, you might see a decline. Uh, but you know, our prediction was you'd have to go pretty far to see that uh, for plants. The other prediction here is that this line is above zero. So we predicted that overall 
uh, you'd see an increase in diversity. So what did the data say? At the level of 600 some uh, townships, uh, we can take a difference in diversity. We have it for uh, the numbers equivalent of uh, uh, Simpson diversity here. And so one of the predictions is upheld. So this positive relationship of the proportion of the township in agriculture at the peak on diversity change. So the more uh, land with, that was converted out of forest, uh, the higher the tree diversity is in the present day, keeping in mind that lots of this land has grown back uh, to forest. The other prediction that this whole line was going to be above zero was not met. So down at this end where there was, uh, you know, very little of the land converted to agriculture, importantly that doesn't mean that it wasn't logged. Almost all of these forests have some history of logging. We actually see a decline in diversity. So perhaps uh, that type of history has made landscapes more homogeneous uh, than uh, the type of history in which lots of it was converted to agriculture. So ultimately our uh, uh, inference has to do with heterogeneity within the landscape, uh, increasing diversity because of this history of land use. We also tested effects of uh, temperature change in nitrogen deposition over time and didn't find any significant effects on uh, the change in diversity. We've also seen lots of talks that, that talk, you know, well, what about homogenization? Uh, and so here we, something, here we see something really interesting. Uh, we've seen it raised that, you know, yes, there's homogenization in some cases, uh, sometimes it's just the opposite. And here we can see a fairly clear relationship with scale. Uh, so here is the compositional dissimilarity between every pair of townships using the past data and the present data. And what we see is that at, at, for, very, for counties that are, for townships that are nearby to one another, they're in fact more different in the present day than they were uh, in the past. And since our inference was that as you go even smaller, in fact, the, the township scale alpha diversity was increased because of heterogeneity. This uh, you know, kind of supports that interpretation. And as soon as you get up uh, you know, to townships that are further than 100 kilometers apart, uh, we see homogenization. Um, and so not only is there sort of variation in whether we see homogenization and, and differentiation, but here we see a clear uh, you know, sense in which the spatial scale can predict whether or not you see uh, differentiation or uh, homogenization. The other place we had data was uh, for Quebec. Uh, I'll just show you results for um, uh, alpha diversity, if you will. So we have taxonomic diversity. There's been lots of talk about functional diversity as well. Is that better? Um, we can talk about that after. Better can only be defined uh, based on what you're trying to uh, achieve. But either way, uh, we can aggregate the data in different grid cell sizes. So either 12.5 kilometers on a side, 20 up to 200, it goes further than that. I'm just gonna show you um, a set of results. And in all cases, this distribution of uh, taxonomic diversity in the modern data is greater than the historical data for these uh, Quebec forests. And it's true both for functional diversity and for taxonomic diversity. So again, we see that this you know, history of land use, which we know to be the dominant driver of compositional changes in this landscape, seems to have had a positive effect on uh, tree diversity uh, at these different scales. Okay, so if we return to this uh, question of what are the right numbers to plug in, so if we think that this 50% might have been uh, too high, uh, you know, not only do we have to rethink what uh, numbers of we're going to plug in here, but here we only have loss, and we know that the data actually goes into the, uh, uh, the gain uh, part of this uh, axis in the empirical data. And so I think uh, that the empirical data clearly suggests that these are not the numbers that will give you a typical um, effect of biodiversity change on ecosystem function in the real world. Uh, you know, the, the empirical data suggests, you know, rarely do we get losses greater than 20%. So if we plug numbers in, you know, the actual average, obviously uh, zero change in, in your driver gets you zero change in your uh, response. If we go up to 20%, even there we have a magnitude of change, which is, you know, lower than almost all of the other uh, drivers that we see uh, in this graph. And so that's the reason, you know, one of our motivations was that, um, uh, you know, we wanted a, a basically a better test of this idea and we, and we don't think uh, that the data support that conclusion uh, nearly as strongly. Okay, so if we return to this uh, scenario, you know, so point one was that we're losing biodiversity. And at some scales, that's absolutely true. So it's true at the global scale in some situations at the local scale, it's definitely true. Uh, and those places where it's most obviously the case are those places where we grow food, which is itself 
uh, I think we can all agree, a pretty e important ecosystem service. And because it's measured in different uh, units than other ecosystem functions and services, uh, it becomes very hard to say, you know, what is the net uh, effect there on services overall. Uh, the second point was that biodiversity is necessary for provisioning of ecosystem services to people. That is true at local scales, maybe a little higher, but really, you know, we'd expect that to be strongest at the local scale. And so overall, I think, you know, uh, the combination of these points, the overall message is not really, not nearly as clear in my view as uh, one will read in a great number of documents from governments, NGOs, ecologists, uh, biodiversity scientists, and so on. Okay, so for this part of the talk, uh, a few conclusions. One is that, uh, you know, biodiversity is definitely declining at the global scale. Uh, and the important point that we've seen in many uh, other talks as well is that it is not declining in all contexts and at all scales. Uh, there are many situations in which it might be uh, increasing, not changing at all. Uh, uh, temporal turnover is ubiquitous. Uh, we saw that from Maria and from Anne. Um, uh, and then, you know, just to quote, myself uh, from one of the articles that I wrote, because one must be quite careful in their wording here, I do think uh, that this set of results means we should, you know, have quite a bit of caution against overgeneralizing the argument that biodiversity decline in nature is a major cause of, uh, cause of declining ecosystem services. Uh, you know, for a fuller sort of argument, you can, you can read that. Okay, so I want to move on to the, the, the last portion of the talk. And, and by way of transition, you know, one of the things that this got me thinking about a great deal was whether, you know, th this very widespread argument, if we sort of continue to make it, even though it's, you know, way more nuanced and not nearly as clear uh, as we've articulated in the past, do we risk a credibility problem? This has sort of come up indirectly in some of the questions I've heard so far. In order to ponder that, I'm just going to let you read uh, some comments from reviewer number one. Uh, on the initial submission of uh, that paper on biodiversity change. So I'm just gonna go through and let you read it and we'll talk about it after. So I think there's a couple of interesting things in here. One, uh, I think I think most of us would agree that you know papers have to be held to high standards of demonstrating results on reasonable doubt. But it's interesting that when you have policy implications, uh, we have to raise the bar. And intuitively, I, I I totally agree. It's it's the flip side of it that I find sort of interesting to ponder, which is that if you study you know genetics of fruit flies, that we can we can then lower the bar because it has no uh, policy implications. But jokes aside, uh, other part of it that's more concerning is that uh, this reviewer explicitly uh, articulates the idea that we should think about not just what we're saying as scientists, but what the media is going to uh, say on our behalf, and then what the conclusion the public might conclude from what the media says. And so if we start deciding, uh, what we're going to say and how we're going to say it because uh, we want to make sure that a certain message gets through. Uh, I think that the public is not as stupid as uh, we might uh, be implying that they are here. They're going to see through it. And I think scientists are going to uh, potentially have a, a credibility problem. So, uh, Here's a question that, I, that I'm going to explore next. So has conventional wisdom about biodiversity drifted somewhat from reality? I think you know that, you know, my thoughts on that are yes, uh, maybe it has. And thinking about the theory presented in my book, I think it can shed a little bit of light actually on uh, how we got there and why uh, we may in fact have, have overstated certain conclusions. And so another way of sort of phrasing that question or a different angle on it really, I, guess, I suppose, is why is there a tendency to view change as loss? So we see that turnover is ubiquitous and everybody agrees that things are getting worse, but is turnover necessarily bad? Okay, so first I'll just describe what the core uh, theme is in the book and then we'll explore what it means for these other uh, questions. 
So we can think about uh, an ecological or evolutionary situation. We have a single site here uh, and there are individual organisms of three different types, blue, red, uh, and green. This could be a population in which those colors are genotypes. And if that's the case, uh, we think of evolution as occurring, microevolution anyway, as occurring via, occurring via four main processes, mutation, drift, gene flow, uh, and selection. And the whole point of my book is to say that if this is a community of different species, even though community ecologists have thought about dozens of factors that might influence community dynamics, all of them ultimately collapse to four closely analogous uh, categories. Speciation creates new things, uh, drift causes stochastic changes, dispersal uh, moves things around, which can have important impacts, uh, and then selection um, is, is, is very closely analogous. And so this, you know, developing this side of the argument is essentially the core of the book. Okay, so now with that in mind, let's think about uh, a very simplistic scenario. Let's say that the environment is changing and it's getting warmer. And in this community, that's gonna mean that types that are uh, red or warm colored are gonna be favored. So we're gonna see some change happening here. What we've seen is that the green type went extinct. The, one of the blues is still hanging on. The red has gotten much more common because uh, it had higher fitness under these warmer conditions. And we've seen this orange species arrive. Uh, it's a relatively warm color. It does better under these conditions. So we have the same number of species, um, the, the shift in composition, something we've talked a lot about. If that's a population of different genotypes, you know, what do we call what just happened? We call it adaptation. The fitness of this set, the average fitness of this set of organisms is higher in this environment than the uh, than it would have been for the previous set of organisms in this same changed environment. So what do we call it if it's a community of different species? Uh, so we've seen you know the word turnover or temporal beta diversity used a lot, but that doesn't actually quite capture it because that's just change. Here we actually have a very specific type of change in which the better uh, suited types have increased at the expense of the uh, less suited types. So in some cases, it's also adaptation. Uh, you know, we, we might want, want to use that word, but it's species turnover in a very particular direction. It's, it's an adaptive uh, type of turnover. Okay, so there's the change. Now we can see the old community at the top, the new community at the bottom, and it's become that way because of uh, warming. And let's say that, you know, let's, let's, let's pretend for a moment that this red species, you know, even got there not very long ago. And we can see that this orange species only arrived uh, very recently. If that's the case, how does an evolutionary biologist judge this change? What, what sort of value judgment do they, do they place on it? Uh, you know, often the persistence of the population is considered, you know, quote, good. And, you know, we've had genetic rescue. So this, uh, the arrival of this orange type and the red type earlier you know, may have helped save this population, and that's a good thing. Uh, we've seen adaptation, which is also a good thing. And so it's all good. If, if, if this is what's happening intraspecifically, we call it good. Now, how does an ecologist judge this change? Uh, those red and orange species are recent arrivals, and so we're going to call them non-native. Uh, and almost universally, that increase of non-native species is considered a bad thing. Uh, because their increase came at the expense of the decline of blue and green, which were native species, that's also bad. And so no matter how we look at it, this change is bad, even though it's the exact same change uh, viewed from a different scale, and even if it's adaptive, so that in the sense that this new community is better suited to this environment than was uh, the old one. If we ask the question, which of these populations is better adapted to the warm, to this world, given that it's now warmer, it's clearly the bottom one. Uh, and in which community would you expect uh, the ecosystem to be, the ecosystem function to be higher in that warmer world? So given that it's warmer, which set of organisms, this one or this one, is likely to produce more biomass, retain more limiting nutrients, uh, and so on? It seems highly likely uh, that it's this one, even though we just referred to all of those changes as ecologically bad. Okay. So I'm almost done. And if we just return here, uh, you know, we, we talked about what do we see when we see New Zealand. Uh, and now we can look at a landscape like this one, which looks like a lot of landscapes uh, in various parts of the world. And so if you open a conservation biology textbook and you see a picture like this, 
uh, you're most likely to see in the caption uh, these things going on. So we've lost forest, which may have caused extinction of some of the forest species. Those remaining patches are isolated. Uh, so within those patches, uh, we might have uh, local scale diversity loss, even though, as Lenore told us, across the landscape, uh, we might have more diversity or at least uh, just as much. Uh, and in uh, those disturbed places, the people plus the disturbances allowed all kinds of bad invasive species to come in. The other things that are happening at the exact same time are that we have now created a landscape in which we are able to produce a whole lot more food than we were uh, in an entirely forested landscape. There's much more heterogeneity in this landscape, so there's likely to be greater diversity, at least of certain uh, taxa. Uh, and in those uh, habitats that we've created, uh, there are very important ecosystem services being uh, provided, and lots of them are being provided by uh, uh, non-native species. So I'm not saying that overall it's good or it's bad, but all of these things are happening and we can get into trouble if we start to emphasize only those uh, which match our preformed uh, uh, opinion about what we'd like to say about a landscape like this. Okay, in conclusion, biodiversity change during the Anthropocene is definitely about loss, uh, especially at the global scale where we have species uh, going extinct. Uh, at the local and regional level, we also have, uh, you know, a great many gains. Uh, they might not always compensate for losses. Um, sometimes they overcompensate, um, but I think we've sort of systematically uh, underemphasized uh, those gains. Uh, and in most places, it's mostly about turnover. And so I was listening very carefully to some of the other talks, and even you, you'll even you often hear people say, uh, you know, we should be concerned about turnover. Uh, and uh, that involves quite a few assumptions actually, because that turnover might be very much adaptive. Uh, it might be the altered environmental conditions that are, uh, that are prompting better adapted species to thrive. And so if there wasn't turnover, I think I would find that more concerning than the fact that there is. And whether it's good or bad, uh, you know, that really, really uh, is not itself a scientific question. You have to insert something about your values to decide whether or not the things that you've observed are uh, good or bad. Uh, if you're interested in this general perspective or these issues, there's uh, lots more to read. And with that, I will thank you. I believe this is the last talk. So I thank you all for uh, sticking around to the very end. And uh, I'd love to hear your questions. I believe that Fabi's microphone is still muted. And that questions are gonna go through her. So Fabi, if you can hear me, I can see you, but your microphone is muted. Oh, Michelle is the host now. Ah, oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> we had some problem with this uh, Zoom thing. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, Professor, uh, thank you for being patient <laughs> with this trouble. And thank you for your time. Thank you for everything. We go to the questions now. Okay, so the first one is from Philippe Soares. Uh, he's saying, let me just start. Thinking more and more about more sustainable measurements and human impacts, would the conversion of monoculture areas to agroforestry be a way to minimize these impacts of the loss of biodiversity in these cultivation areas? And there is a second part of the question. Would you like me to continue or? Uh, well, I mean, we can start there. I mean, th th that's certainly not my area of expertise. I've uh, I've heard many things about agroforestry, which makes it sound like a very promising 
way to try to um, balance the simultaneous goals of, of food production and uh, other ecosystem services not related to uh, food and even even related to food and, and pollination. Um, I, I, I'm not going to try to say more than that, given that uh, the specifics there are beyond my own expertise. Okay, now the, the continuation, he says, in addition, can the application of these systems in agroforestry maintain species, ecological functions, and phylogenetic relationships when compared to protected natural systems? Uh, maybe. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, certainly, uh, as I said, uh, you know, the, the studies I've seen without uh, scrutinizing uh, the details suggest agroforestry is a very uh, promising tool to uh, simultaneously achieve um, multiple goals without having costs that are uh, too extreme in any one uh, particular type of ecosystem service uh, that we're aiming to uh, get out of a particular place. Okay. The second question is from Sebastian Sendoya. Thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, if modern communities are adapting to Anthropocene change, what if this adaptation means ecosystem function loss or even evolutionary dead ends? Would it not be necessary to look at functional or phylogenetic adaptation also? Oh, so, I mean, so the question of, uh whether and to what degree some of these changes um, uh, are adaptive or might be adaptive, I think is a, is, is a big question and, and, and an open one to a certain degree. So, I mean, I showed uh, that, you know, some of the shifts in species distributions at our own field site and, and at many other sites where you see similar things are consistent with this sort of adaptive view. I mean, you know, the, the, the altered conditions are favoring certain species, which, uh, you know, it's reasonable to assume until we've um, looked further that, that they are likely to, you know, let's say produce more biomass than the ones that now perform uh, poorly there. We also see a, a, a huge time lag so that the environment is changing probably faster than these things can keep up. I mean, you never expect um, adaptation to be keeping perfect pace with a changing environment, whether it's evolutionary uh, adaptation or uh, adaptation uh, at a, a different level. But I think uh, there, there's there's huge potential to to actually ask this question about what is has that turnover been adaptive? Um, and uh, I suppose what I uh, uh, would would caution against is is sort of the knee jerk reaction that we should somehow be um, concerned about turnover. Uh, you know, my first level assumption would be that to a certain degree it is adaptive uh, uh, and it, it may well not be in, in, in many cases. And so, uh, you know, in, until you actually know the answer to that, uh, you can't, you know, act on, on it one way or the other. But I see no reason, as I said, I, I'd be more concerned if a huge environmental change uh, was not causing a turnover in species because the ones that are there uh, seem less likely to be able to provide ecosystem services uh, than ones that would do better under those changed conditions. Okay. Uh, the next one is from Johnny Gedges. What do you think about the concept of novel ecosystems? Yeah, I mean, so there are certainly um, many places on earth where the composition of species at present has no analog or no, you know, there, there's, there's been nothing like it in history that we know of. Uh, and yet the, you know, when you, when you look at productivity, nutrient cycling, pollination, dispersal, um, you know, it, it, it sure looks to be uh, functioning. You know, I think some of the, the debate on that issue is, you know, should those ecosystems uh, merit the same degree of protection as other ones, for example? And that really boils down to values. Like, as I said, that is not a scientific question. Whether or not you think that ecosystem is valuable, uh, worthy of protection, uh, you know, just depends entirely on, on what you're aiming uh, to do. Once you've defined what you want to do, a scientist can help guide the achievement of that goal, but it can not really... Um, uh, you know, guide you into what you should prefer. Okay. 
And the next one is from Maíra Cardoso. Uh, as you said, many other researchers are presenting a new perspective of conservation ecology. Do you think this changing perspective is the new paradigm for ecology in this century? <laughs> the new paradigm for the century? Well, we're, we're certainly seeing a, a, you know, a range of voices that uh, have different points of view on uh, whether or not you know, species not historically present in some place should be automatically, uh, you know, considered, you know, something to eradicate, or if we should be more open to accepting the fact that because we have, uh, for example, created ecosystems, we've created disturbance patterns that are very similar across different continents, and that is probably one of the reasons behind them looking biotically more uh, similar, you know, whether or not you perceive that as good news or bad news, uh, really, as, as I was saying, I don't see it as a, as a scientific issue. And I think um, uh, you're, you're definitely hearing a range of voices on, on that right now. You know, whether or not there's one, you know, identifiable discrete paradigm that's gonna replace another, um, you know, I doubt that it, 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 it's, it's sort of evolving um, as it has uh, for a long time. You know, it certainly feels like we're in a moment of, of, of rapid flux, but uh, it, it seems unlikely that one whole paradigm is going to replace another, but perhaps, you know, a, a more diverse set of views on some of these issues will, uh, uh, will end up at the table. Okay, now Kelly Inagaki. If we are looking for biodiversity only, how can we have different responses like loss in global scale, but turnover in mi minor, scale, minor scales? Why is it why is it different? I can't say that I follow uh, the question. What is there? Is there a yeah. way to reformulate? Uh, I uh, actually, I, I don't know. Yeah, as the person said, uh, we are looking only for biodiversity. How can we have different responses, like global scale, or? Uh, turnover in minor scales. I think it's uh, something like, uh, let me see. Uh, is an idea like a loss in local scale versus turnover in global scales, for example. Uh, okay, how, how do we reconcile those? I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I totally follow, but I mean, I'm, I think Anne might have been asked a similar question at the end of her uh, talk, and it's, and it's not, uh, it's really not so difficult to, to, to reconcile, um, you know, loss at one scale and gain at another scale, uh, uh, because as, you know, as species move around, it's, it's uh, you know, easy to explain how you can get an increase in the number of species at a small scale, yet loss, uh, at a global scale, if you take it to its extreme, if the entire world only has one species left, then uh, you'll you'll start to see you know stronger dependencies there. But in the in, in the current state, uh, uh, you know, it, it's not difficult to reconcile those different possibilities. Okay. So, so uh, I apologize if I didn't quite follow the question, but yes. Uh... Or maybe it was something like, uh, how can we have uh, laws and turnover of, at the same time? Maybe, but I, I don't know. I can skip to the next question. Okay. It's from Thais Anatam. She said, I appreciate your idea about adaptive turnover. However, isn't it dangerous to focus only on ecosystem services for nature conservation, especially because it is built on an anthrop anthropocentric view of nature? Yeah, so again, you know, whether the, the motivations that people have for protecting nature are variable. And uh, if, so, so a great many discussions in ecology and conservation begin with the question of what can we do or say that will convince the most other people to join, to share our values for nature conservation. Uh, and that's a fine conversation to have, but as a scientist, that is a, uh, it's actually 
problematic and potentially even dangerous starting point because you're beginning with what you want to conclude. Uh, and then subsequently, uh, it'll hardly be surprising if you figure out a way to, to conclude that. And so, uh, uh, you know, I, I would agree that if, if, if we're in the business of selling conservation to the general public, some of whom might not already share the same values, if you, you know, base the entire argument on, on ecosystem services, you most definitely open yourself up to uh, then, you know, losing some of the things that you really love if your favorite endangered species provides no contribution to ecosystem services uh, at all. Absolutely. Um, but uh, whether or not you should care about that species to begin with, um, is really up to you. So, so again, there's there's a there's a very uh, sort of fraught zone in which uh, science and values can get get mixed up, and ultimately, um, we can end up with a credibility issue if it's if it's perceived that uh, we're we're simply trying to convince people of something, and we'll just say whatever it takes to uh, to do that. Okay. Uh, the next one is from Christian Dombros. If local species pools result from dispersal from regional pools, do you expect that eventually we might flip the, this coin and start to lose species locally because of regional and global loss of species? Yeah, so, it, I mean, it depends. I mean, predicting the future is... Uh... Is, is is never very wise but uh so if, if we think about this this cartoon in which we saw that you know at the regional scale uh in fact a great many regions have have far more species than they had you know four or five hundred years ago let's say um and so if i'm thinking about you know how losses are ultimately going to reach the local scale uh uh, we're just a very, very long way from that uh, uh, happening because you first have to get it going from the global scale uh, down to the regional scale and then down to the local scale. And at least for plants, um, uh, you know, Chris Thomas and others have, have looked at the fact that, you know, the more you move plants around, you in fact get hybrids, you actually start creating uh, species potentially at a higher rate than than we were before. And so, uh, you know, whether or not those global losses, at least for plants, are going to end up, you know, uh, impacting the local scale. At the extreme end of the argument, it, it sort of has to be true. Once there's one species left, there can only be one species at any scale. Um, uh, but it seems like we're, we're so far from there. And, and there's even, you know, if you look at long enough time scales, the potential for, um, you know, the generation of new uh, diversity. So it's a, it's a good question, but uh, it, it's, not, it's not a short-term concern of mine, let's say. Okay, uh, another one from Alexander, Alexander Rodan Arevalo Sandi. We as scientists should be cautious when we say that biodiversity is being lost globally because there are many specific groups, uh, scientific groups, sorry, that could say the contrary. What is the right side? They could say that globally we're gaining biodiversity? That uh, when we say that biodiversity is being lost globally. Uh, so that, um, I mean, it's, I mean, I have seen some suggestions that, that, uh, that there might be an anthropogenic impact on speciation rates that can partially counter uh, extinctions. It seems most compelling for plants, but certainly once we go uh, into the animal and the, and the vertebrate world, as far as I know, uh, there's you know very clear evidence that there's been far more diversity lost than uh, uh, gained, and so I, I don't see any danger in, in, in claiming that there has been global biodiversity loss. I'm not sure what these other groups are uh, of scientists who are, who are countering that, but um, I guess that's as much as I can say on that. 
Ok. And Bruno Soares de Tangil uh, is saying, uh, given the expected changes in the forthcoming years, do you think that there should be a kind of change of paradigm in conservation biology to refit conservation strategies to protect current communities, let's say, occurring at present, instead of traditional communities, what we consider they should be? I think that uh, what I what I advocate most is is complete honesty when we're articulating our conservation goals. So as I was saying earlier, if if somebody describes an objective, they would like to maximize the carbon storage in an ecosystem. Well, then science can guide uh, the pathway to achieving that goal. Or if the goal is to simply keep whatever species were there uh, at a given moment, whether it's the past or the present there, uh, then you know, science can help you achieve that goal as well. Uh, but whether you want to achieve those goals or not uh, is almost entirely a question of what your uh, values are. And there, there certainly has been um, a tradition of, of, of thinking that, you know, the sort of historical state of an ecosystem before people had major impacts is the, is the best possible uh, state of that system. And, uh, and, you know, I just don't see a sense in which science does or even could support that uh, notion. And yet we often communicate things as if, um, uh, as if it does. And so uh, I don't think it's really any one person's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not up to one person to decide what direction conservation should go uh, because, you know, we're all open, we're all free to have particular values that uh, prompt us to, to value certain uh, aspects of nature and science can come in when we're talking about how to achieve those goals, not necessarily in defining what they are. Okay, another one is from André Padial. Do you believe that a better link between ecosystem services and biodiversity should consider unique services provided by unique species? In other words, is it possible that we are flowing in pulling different ecosystem services into the same overall category? Uh, so I think there's definitely a, I mean, it, it's not even really my, my field exactly how people go about analyzing them, but certainly a major challenge, which is reflected in that question is uh, combining information or data on different whether it's ecosystem services or really any attribute of a of a of an area on Earth, uh, you know, it's, it might be species diversity, it might be efficiency of pollination, it might be productivity, it might be uh, decomposition rate, carbon storage. Uh, all of these things are measured in units that are not the same. So as soon as you want to decide whether or not um, a particular state of the system is, is preferred to another. Uh, it is necessary to apply uh, a set of values to those different attributes uh, to decide which is the, the state you'd like it uh, to be in. There's, there's no uh, objective formula for saying how much you should care about carbon storage versus the diversity of insects in a given place. Um, maybe they're positively correlated, and so you can just try to maximize everything. Um, uh, but but big picture, there's almost always trade-offs of some sort. I mean, they're reflected in some of the questions, and it is necessary once you actually go from you know data to action about how we're going to intervene in the world. Uh, you have to uh, put a value filter uh, over that, and I think we should try to be uh, really very conscious of of when we're doing that um, instead of expressing essentially our own values as if it as if they were universal or as if they were uh, somehow scientific. Okay. And we have two questions about exotic species 
And one is from Isadora Moreira. Do you think we are missing some important modern processes when we remove invasive species from the analysis of biodiversity? And André Gomes Cifuentes, uh, do you think that the exotic species can improve the adaptation of local species, not the extinction? Uh, so I'm not sure in the last bit, maybe, um, maybe he meant the sort of functioning of the system, but, but I mean, those, those, those questions are uh, related. And, and so, so certainly let's, so, so if we just go back to the experiments in which, um, you know, the, the number of plant species in an area, uh, you know, predicts, or in an experiment, it affects the uh, productivity of the system, let's say. Uh, you know, that that's, it actually says nothing about the origin of those species. And if you look at some of the experiments, they include, you know, like grasslands of North America include lots of non-native species that can be very common and they can end up in experiments like that. And so, uh, you know, what seems to be important in those situations is that you have uh, different species using the environment in different ways uh, and they do so in a complementary way. And, and there's every reason to think that non-native species um, uh, would, would contribute to diversity uh, in, in, in the same way in, in many uh, instances. And you know, even more than that, often you know, there, there are cases in which it's actually might be short term, but where like a monoculture of a non-native plant, in fact, you know, produces far more biomass and holds far more nutrients than like any of the mixtures of anything. So it could be it could be a short term thing because of uh, anime release, um, and you know maybe I'm sure we can find some other function of the ecosystem which isn't as, uh, you know, which is which is which is impacted uh, differently. Uh, but non-native species, especially given how we've modified the environment. So if I look out my window here and I think about some of the environments, uh, you know, in an urban and agricultural area, uh, they are very much like the environments where a huge species pool has evolved for much longer in Europe and parts of Asia than it has in North America and those similar habitats. And so those species are quite likely to uh, contribute to providing greater ecosystem services than uh, than the natives are so I mean it's almost always context dependent but but big picture uh, yes okay the next one is from Juan Trujillo do you think that we could advance in theory of ecological communities without knowing properly regional species pools around the world so can we advance theory without knowing regional species pools C certainly there's um I, I think i think characterizing species pools is uh is a really big and really important uh challenge because there's a great number of a great many analyses including you know ones i've i've been involved in where the inference depended on defining which species could potentially be in a certain place and you know, often you're limited to whatever plots were sampled, you know, in some broader uh, area, or maybe you have a, um, uh, you know, a list of all the species in a given, you know, larger uh, protected area. Uh, sometimes people redefine the species pool based on environmental conditions. So I'm only going to consider the possible species that were here as those that can at least tolerate this degree of wetness in the soil or something. But there, there, there's huge uncertainty in all of those decisions. Uh, with respect to whether or not those species, you know, could really grow there, are they likely to disperse there? So, uh, in, in all of those analyses, I think there's there's a ton of uncertainty. I mean, I'm not th that might be inevitable, and that there will always be uncertainty, no matter how much knowledge you have. But it's it's it sure seems like an area in which uh, um, you know pr progress could be made. So so knowing what that regional species pool, or, or I suppose testing different ones does seem like a really important uh, challenge. Okay. The next one is from Jacqueline Zeni. How much of the results about biodiversity changes are biased by our inability to accurately reconstruct past species composition? Yeah, so, so uh, any data set applies to the, ta the, the, the time period and the area where it was collected. So, uh, you know, we know that there's, um, you know, huge dependencies, uh, context dependencies, let's say. And so, um, 
you know, one of the motivations for looking at our, our tree data set was to, you know, go, go, go a little bit further back uh, in time prior to, you know, a, a period of massive uh, landscape transformation. And there are cases where you could argue that, you know, there's a certain time series that, you know, you have good reason to believe that before it began, there were already major losses. Um, uh, or just the opposite. So, you know, before it began, there were probably, you know, this sort of uh, temporal gains and now we're, we're seeing them lost. And so, uh, you know, you, you need data to uh, reconcile or to test uh, these alternatives. There's, there's a very strong tendency uh, from my perception of ecologists to lean towards the bad news story. So, so, let, let's say there's you know two possibilities. So I, you often hear about you know what about extinction debt? These species aren't extinct yet, but they're going extinct. Uh, and yet very hardly anybody asks a question about the fact that there's a great number of species that are going to become non-native somewhere that haven't become non-native yet. So it's another type of lag. Uh, and yet we almost always lean towards or gravitate towards those possibilities uh, that tell a, a bad news story. So so big picture. You know, definitely the data applied to the times and the places where they were um, uh, collected, and we can use you know other knowledge to assess their likely generality or you know the likelihood that they might be a huge exception to some other general uh, uh, thing. But we 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 also want to be careful to always consider equally uh, plausible alternatives. Okay, the next one is from Joyce Souza. At local scales, there is adaptive turno turnover, but at global scales, we have extinction. Don't you think that at some point, one will influence the other? Global loss in the pool of species won't be bad for the local ecosystem in a future scenario. Yeah, it's, it's, it's possible that that mirrors a question we had uh, earlier and uh, and you know, it's a there's there's a lot of time has to pass between uh, now and then. It's 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 possible. It's possible. But as I was saying, you know, my, my expertise is in plants, and when I look at the, you know, what we know about what's happened so far, uh, we seem it, it it doesn't it doesn't strike me as a uh, major concern over the, you know, medium term. Let's say. Okay. Adriana Martini is asking you, uh, the last scenario presented had only one driver, warming, but probably there will be many drivers in the future global changes. Would this idea about adaptive turnover be supported in a, in a scenario of multiple drivers? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's, a good, it's a great question. So, I mean, if, uh, I mean, generally speaking, if, uh, you know, if, if, if we follow the logic of uh, Darwin, really, then, you know, whatever the changes, uh, whether they're in one dimension or multiple dimensions, uh, the species that succeed, uh, uh, you know, are likely to be better suited to the new conditions than the ones that were unable to succeed given those changes. You know, whether or not environmental changes along many dimensions might in fact uh, begin to really reduce the number of species that can even succeed in those conditions. Uh, that's, that's a really good uh, and important question to ask. Um, uh, so yeah, I think, I think I'll stop there. I mean, that's uh, probably as much as I can say about that. Okay. Elena Galvanesi is asking you, do you think the reduction in our bias to interpret and analyze the data might change our understanding of the processes maintaining the biodiversity? I'm sorry, would you mind repeating that? Okay, sure. Uh, do you think the reduction in our bias to interpret and analyze the data might change our understanding of the processes maintaining the biodiversity? Oh, okay, so, so if we're, Okay, so if I think there's some biases um, and we're able to reduce or eliminate them, will that alter our perception of the processes? I think it will, uh, yeah, possibly. I mean, if, uh, 
Um, I mean, most of what I focused on was, you know, let's say patterns and then uh, interpretations about whether or not they were good or bad. So I think we'll it can have a huge impact on, on, on how we go about doing that and whether we even decide to try to do that, you know, when we're wearing our scientist's hat. Um, yeah, but yes, certainly, you know, even if you're looking at, at, at turnover, you know, placing a great deal of emphasis on, on the losses rather than the gains, uh, yeah, it, it, it may well, um, or redressing that might, you know, alter your perception of the important uh, processes underlying uh, community dynamics, sure. Okay. Uh, the next one is from Joyce Souza. She's saying, uh, while we're still lacking about, uh, while there is still a lack uh, about plants, shouldn't we worry that turnover may be, may decouple important interactions between pollinators and flowers, for example? So if there's, so turnover in, let's say plants can have cascading effects on uh, other organisms. Uh, I mean, that's most definitely true. Uh, uh, and again, I suppose I would encourage us to think about all of the different things are going on, not just whether or not the pollinators of a declining species are gonna be impacted, but whether or not the species that are increasing or you know, entering an ecosystem actually provide opportunities for uh, you know, uh, other species that are currently rare or not, or, or not present. So you know, to get back to the question about novel ecosystems, you, know, you have you know, places on earth that are you know, combinations of species with very little evolutionary history in common. Uh, and yet you know, they do what people call ecological fitting. They, they nonetheless uh, fit together into a ecosystem that's you know, sort of thriving, if you will, from any, you know, kind of almost no matter how you were to go about measuring that. Um, so on one hand, I, I most definitely agree with the thrust of that question, that, that change turnover in one group could have cascading effects on uh, other groups, um, whether it's all bad or, you know, just different or even, you know, quote, better if there's, you know, a greater number of insect species that can, uh, you know, take advantage of the more diverse plant community because it got warmer in a place that was already cold, you know, we, we should we should be open to all those opportunities, uh, possibilities. Okay, and the last one from Larissa Daupas. Even though some changes in populations or communities seem to be an adaptation and we might judge them as good, don't you think we should focus our ecological and ethical commitment of not acting towards causing these changes, especially considering a precautionary principle and that these adaptations might lead to bad scenarios in future that we do not uh, fully understand now. Yeah, so uh, ethics is obviously not my area of uh, direct expertise, but again, uh, I don't see an a priori reason to think that the turnover is going to cause problems, right? So, so it could be that turnover will improve certain, uh, you know, outcomes that we're interested in. I, I, I certainly, you know, as a as, as a as a person, um, you know, believe in the precautionary principle. Uh, you know, when applied reasonably, I mean, at some degree, if, if you take it to its extreme, you never do anything at all. Uh, but, you know, if, if, for example, there is a, you know, small but not infinitesimal probability of a really big problem, uh, then uh, I, I certainly think uh, we should adopt or, or think seriously about that principle. Uh, we have to define what constitutes a really big problem, of course, uh, and be and be careful not to, uh, again, imply that something that we really like is somehow scientifically proven to be the right thing we should all be aiming for. Okay, so Professor 
Thank you very, very much for being here with us today. It was an honor and thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks to you. It was a really, it was a pleasure to be here, to listen to the other ones, to get all these great questions. Uh, it would be great if I could, I guess, see more people and, and hang out, but uh, this is where we're at. So thanks a lot. It was, it was really fun. Yes, perhaps sometimes you, sometime you can come to Brazil. In, in the a, future. Awesome. Yes, possibly. So thank you very much, Professor. And I have, I have a message here for you people. Can you find it here? Uh, I would like to say that uh, we are sorry from, we, from the organization team. We are sorry if we did not translate uh, or edit your questions correctly. Uh, we are doing everything that we can because the questions come very quickly and we are trying to organize them and, and translate. So sometimes they may not uh, be as perfect as you wanted to, but I'm sorry again. And thank you for sending the questions and being so um, comprehensive. Thank you very much. So uh, now we have a break for the cough break and we come back at uh, 4 p.m. to our discussion section. And as we said before, you are all invited, even those who are not going to participate actively. Okay, so thank you so much and see you in 30 minutes. <laughs>